I mean, starting from the beginning, I don't know how old I was, but when from a really young age, Sonoma being the closest NASCAR track at the time to my family, being from Southwest Washington, it was a big deal for us when they came to Sonoma. And so every year, biggest thing was my grandma, my dad, and I would venture down here. And, and as long as we were free, we'd be here for the whole weekend and, and watch the cup cup races and you know the k and races at the time and now ARCA. And, um, and just, it became such a big event in my life. Cause growing up, just really, my parents were tight on money with, with the business just getting started. And, and we weren't going on much vacation because being the youngest of seven, there's a lot of expenses. So that was like our one getaway every year that we knew was gonna be there that we could look forward to. And, and to spend that time with my grandma and grandpa was huge. I mean, there was times I remember just sitting there with my grandma and she'd be all smiling. I'm like, what? Like, what's so funny? And she's like, that's gonna be you out there someday. And I'm, maybe, I, I'm sure, grandma. You know, but she, she fully meant it. I mean, before we ever even started racing. Uh, so when we started racing, it was still something that didn't go away. I mean, we still went down there every year, even when I was in baby grands and the late model stuff. And um, through the whole process, um, she was my biggest fan. Having my family around, nobody's seen more of this journey than them. They saw the passion and, and how much I wanted to be involved in it, but couldn't for so long. And now that we are here, realizing really where we are now and, and seeing it through the eyes of that 10 year old me that would have appreciated it so much. You know, I kind of forget how cool this is. Johnson Jr. off the racetrack, and I see some damage. He may have come into contact with that tire barrier there, and indeed he has. Eric Johnson Jr. into the tire barrier in turn 12. Just as we were looking at Jake Finch, we see Eric Johnson Jr. off the racetrack. He had been up into the top 10, and that is going to be an early end of his day. Take a look at what happened there as he is off the racetrack. He has got those wheels turned as hard as he can turn them to the right. Unfortunately, no traction on the grass. And Eric Johnson Jr. into the tire barrier there in turn 12. And he's going to climb out and call it a day. The second Bill McAnally racing entry. We'll come to a early end here at Portland International Raceway. You know, there is a young guy right there, Eric Johnson, who has worked hard to go out and, and sell himself to sponsors, has put his package together, and uh, has put himself in one of the most competitive cars in the West Series. So, a tough break for him here today, but uh, keep an eye on this young man. He has got a big season ahead of him. And all of a sudden, the right front tire just didn't do anything. So, when I got back, I don't know exactly what happened. Um, and then once they started explaining, 
It's like that made me feel a lot better because I just told him like I wasn't out of control and even if you asked me what would I have changed, I don't know what I would have done differently. Yeah. So it was just one of those things where I'm like You know that your process was the same as it was every lap yeah, before that. Honestly when I started on oval, um, I feel like I had a lot of tunnel vision. Like when you when you start out on oval Everything's happening so quick, and especially as a young driver, like it's it's hard to think big picture. But when you get on a road course and things get strung out, and all of a sudden you really have to focus on corner entries and apexes and and seeing every corner differently, that that goes into a play when you come back to ovals, because then all of a sudden you get to an oval and you realize both ends aren't exactly the same, and then you start thinking big picture a lot more. And honestly, for me, it slowed my thought process down. And the road courses teach you a lot more of a eyes up discipline. You're battling drivers on a circle track. Yes, you have to mind your car and things, but I think road course racing is a lot more, you're racing the track and the other guys out there are just doing the same thing. And it's kind of like a dang sled race or the Iditarod. I mean, you're all in the same race, but when you pass each other, it's just because one's running their own race separately from the other a little bit better and and um, you know you still got to make it to the end even if you're the fastest guy out there. How does the muscle memory change from like an oval to a road course? Because when Max is in, he's running the oval, so he gets into a groove and it's instinct. Kicks. Yes. How, how consciously are you thinking about each corner versus is it that same kind of groove you get in? So the thing that's a little different about the muscle memory when it comes to a road course because you have so many different places for runs to develop, you have drafting on long straightaways coming into a play, um, you have brake fade now coming in because you're getting so much heat in the car. Um, you know, things that just you typically wouldn't be exposed to in a circle track race, you get thrown out of, out of your rhythm much easier on a road course because one small difference from when you're running out there by yourself to now running in a pack. I mean, there's times running in the stock car, we could be running bumper to bumper down the straightaways, and all of a sudden now I gotta break 150 feet earlier because we're going that much faster. So to go off of instinct can be really hard on a road course. Getting in your rhythm is a completely different animal on a circle track than in a road course, it's a little more of a balance than it is a rhythm. You gotta find when to give and take. Because right. you take all race long, you're not finishing. So. That's all. I got one of those uh, like, couple massages. I see your photo. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Late model to ARCA couldn't be any more different. An ARCA car, yes, you do drive them on an edge, but the edge is to where the car gives out before you do. And, and in a late model, I feel like the limitation comes to driver, really. It's how free can you get that car around the track as a driver. And in an ARCA car, you get the car underneath you, they have 13 inch slicks. I mean, you got more grip than you can ask for, but eventually, that tire becomes a shear point and goes away and your car shoving up the track. Guys call it a boat all the time, dump truck, whatever you want to call it. They take a different discipline on getting them to work for you than um, a late model. I feel like a late model, it's like driving as a teenager. You just beat the hell out of it and make that thing do what you want it to and it looks rough and it sounds rough, but it works. An ARCA car is like driving a Cadillac fast. You try to push it, it doesn't work. You take it nice and easy and all of a sudden you get all the right quality out of it. Smooth is fast. I think you got to think big picture, but the other thing is just the competition. The competition is stiff, but I think everyone's got enough respect out there for one another to use each other up the most they can without taking too much in most cases. Now you do have your oddballs here and there, but I just think that the competition level and level of respect goes up. But I just think when you're racing the same guys, week after week or month after month in ARCA and you know what everyone's had to do to get there and you know some may say it's not very much some they've had to give them their whole life for it everyone just knows what it takes to get there and I think they just know that there's a little bit more on the line than what's right in front of you 
and that plays a big role in how guys race. It's different, but I think a lot carries over from one to the other. They just, they definitely have their separation. Yeah, I couldn't really get after it there because every time I tried to push and either downshift into third or upshift into third hard, it, it just didn't want to take. And zero problems with the other gears, correct? Correct. Zero problems with the other gears. It's just third. But it did it for all three laps there, so I just, like didn't want to slam it. And no indication prior to that in any of the previous runs? Not a single, single bit. But it made me wheel hop because I went to go grab it and it didn't grab it and then it finally did and just threw the car up in the air down into four and just started wheel hopping down there because of it. Yeah, four. May not get a time in here, boys. There's no way we can at least roll it around and, and get credit for a lap. I mean, I don't think so. I could try. Do we need to put a lap into right? I believe so. I believe so. So we're going to try. We're going to have push me back. I'm going to try to force this thing into gear and then we're going to rock. It's acting like it's in reverse. This time, and when I put it into jump. first, it just like dies as I try to disengage the clutch. You can start without qualifying if that's what you're asking. All right, Bill, the transmission's being funny. Do you want me to put a lap in or no? It's acting like it doesn't want to come out of reverse. I can try to see if it'll stick. If you've got the pull-out bearing pushed, it's, it gets a crankshaft, it's not going to be good to pull the motor up, so we need to make sure it's safe. Okay, that's your car. I can, I can pull right back in here. It's locked up. We're not putting the lap in. Copy that, buddy. We're sitting there in qualify. Yeah. <sighs> All the cars are driving around you. You're on jet. <laughs> What's in your head? Uh, I think last year me would have been a lot more frustrated. I'll start with saying that. Um, you know, it's kind of like the same thing with, with Portland after we wrecked. You sit there and you have this moment where you can be like, okay, I can get really upset or I can just mm, kind of take the next step. Because, and you know, and I think when we started, I've had moments where I've gotten really upset and I don't throw fits to other people but I've definitely thrown fits to myself or beat up on myself. And and that's, I mean, being self-critical, I think is how you get better in a lot of ways. But in those moments, it kind of was the, the biggest thing, the deciding factor in it, I guess you could say, was I didn't think being upset was gonna get me anything. So when I'm watching all those cars out there, I'm thinking to myself, okay, my job's getting harder and harder and harder and I'm watching this and now all of a sudden I'm like, okay, I might get a lap in and we might just get to, you know, we've already, not only do we have issues in practice, we just threw the kitchen sink at it after that for setup changes and I have no clue what the car is gonna feel like and I'm thinking, okay, well, at least I'll get a chance to feel it in qualifying. Okay, now there's 30 seconds left and I don't get to do that anymore. Okay, the session's done. Am I even in the race? And like, I, all I could think was, okay, we're in the race. Now you just move on. And, and that's exactly, is like, you just, you had no time to freak out, to worry, to throw fit. It was what it was. I already knew like, okay, our, our jobs as hard as it got, it can be now. So we just got to focus on getting the car ready. Um, and we just jumped straight into that. So it wasn't as big of a deal to me as it was, say, to like, I know my parents were kind of freaking out watching that because we've said over and over again, if we could just find a way to figure out whatever our bad luck has been in qualifying, we'll be good. That was our goal coming down here this weekend was just qualify well. Well, <laughs> that didn't work. So, you know, whatever. We uh, start from the back and, and I think the guys know what to say to get me in the right mindset of just you just can't waste time you got to go forward and and I know they know me enough that no matter what they say I'm still gonna run my own race there's nobody's ever gonna tell me how to drive the car but you can sure put a mindset in, in you know in my head um, and I've had that through a bunch of races after you know breaking the transmission last year in Sonoma Bill said hey, use the brakes this time, not the transmission to slow down, you know, and that stuck with me all race long. Um, I had to tell myself over and over again to, to mindfully 
get the car to the end of the race. And so watching all those cars go, I just, I knew we had to move on and, and set ourselves up to go from the back. I want to say thank you guys for all your hard work. I mean, you guys really worked your tails off for me. So we'll just do this one car at a time, get her done. It's gonna kind of be big eyes here on the start, though. I mean, I know they're gonna jam up, so I'm just gonna do what I can to keep it clean from there, and then lap two, let's go for it. All right, boys, let's go to work. Jam four, coming to the green right here. Eight cars off. 10 away, 5 away, rolling, rolling, green, green, green. Go, Eric, go, 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 go. Come in here, man. Come in, take it, it's yours. It's all yours, all yours. You're going to get two right here. You're going to get two. Come in, go, go, go. Take it, take it all, take it all, take it all. Take what you need here. These guys are really slowing each other up here. Easy pick, it's one at a time. You go take it. Be ready to defend here. Be ready to defend here on the on the right side. All clear, all clear behind you. No pressure on the back yet. Take that spot. Get in there. Got a boy. You are all clear. All clear, all clear, all clear. Get down there. Very nice drive in. Very nice drive in. Get around them. Still out there. You're clear, you're clear, you're clear. No pressure on the back. Two, three, four, five, Carly. Keep pulling hard. Get after that next one. Just being brutally honest, like, when we were at Tri-Cities, I felt like I took it one at a time. Every one felt like a, okay, that's another one, on to the next, okay. You know, this time, it was simply so many cars, it was like a kid with a piece of candy out in front of him. I saw the lead pack up here, and anything between point A and point B, I almost just looked through. Um, I don't remember all the passes, if I'm gonna be honest with you. It was literally just, Catch them, do what you have to. Catch them, do what you have to. Don't waste time, we gotta go. Don't waste time, we gotta go. And there was times where like, a couple guys pinched us or a couple guys shown that like, okay, you're gonna have to work a little harder. And those are the ones I remember because I had to stop for a second, figure out where I was better than them, set it up, then go. And on to the next. And, we, and so, you kind of get, like you said, so focused and so, um, I don't know, in a rhythm, I guess. You're just, uh, it's 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 hard to describe but it felt really good to pass so many cars so quick but I honestly looked up and when we were inside the top 10 I didn't even know I passed that many cars because it's Sonoma is so hard to pass in some in certain aspects that you know and, and you're so deep in the pack you got to work so hard um, you never get a moment to like really just like settle in and take a deep breath and figure out what's going on. So you start 30th by the time you get a chance to look up and realize you're 10th. And it's just, it's kind of an odd way of things going, but you, you know, for us, I think I was just so motivated on getting forward, but also taking care of the car. Um, I was just letting other guys break, other guys make mistakes. And I was just trying to pretty much run in my own little bubble and make sure that nobody breaks that bubble. And meanwhile, that bubble just kept working through the field while everyone was making their mistakes. And my main focus was just minimizing error. Um, as a rookie, I think it's pretty easy to 
put yourself in a situation where your race ends quickly on your own doing. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that I didn't, I didn't do that. Everything you got. Don't leave nothing on the table, Eric. We got this. Time to be aggressive, Eric. Time to be aggressive with it. Let's go. Drive the wheels off that thing, bud. You're doing a great job. Give her shit. Good run, good run, good run. All right, bud. I need 10 good laps here, plus seven seconds for the car behind you here. This is the last car coming up. Make sure you get by him quick, quick, quick. So with about 10 to go, the team starts coming on the radio and they start counting down every lap. 10 more for me, buddy. All right, I need nine more perfect laps. Three perfect clean laps. Get it done. Alright, I need eight more. And all I get, I literally, I swear, I thought about coming on that radio and telling them, do not tell me another lap until it's the white flag. Because I am about to throw up from the pressure, you know what I mean? Because Brandon Jones was behind us. He's not going to give an inch when he gets to me. So I'm in this mindset of just run, run. And they're telling me, seven seconds back. Okay, now he's three seconds back. I need three more laps, buddy. And I'm thinking to myself, man, this is going to be close. Just get to the end. The second that yellow flag comes out, I just was like, of course, why not? Why not make today harder than it already has been? You know, so we rack back up and the entire time under a yellow flag, just pacing, I am like not, probably not doing anything I should be, not looking at the gauges, not controlling my switches. All I'm thinking is uh, you're just driving into a, a, a storm that you know is gonna suck and you just have to figure your way out. I just played the game and I think it actually paid off because I quit thinking so hard and just said, screw it, this is, let's just have some fun. You gotta use it up, buddy. Use everything you got, I want nothing left. Rise up, it is going to get wild. All right, Eric, shake your arms out. Shake it all out. Next flag's gonna end it here, Eric. They're rolling, 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 rolling. Rolling, great, great, great. On your left, tight on your left. Take both of them. Don't give them anything. Do not give them anything. Take it. Get what you can out of the corner. Need everything you got out of the second one. Get close. Prepare to defend here. Make him go left. Make him go left. There you go. Roll through it. Roll, roll, roll. Go, 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 go. Go, buddy, go. Yes, Eric. Yeah, baby. What? What about that? Yeah. I'm so proud of you, Eric. Get her up, brother. Get her up. Thank you, Mom and Dad, for letting me do this. Seriously, I love you guys.
Andy Grands and the late model stuff. And um, the, through the whole process, um, she was my biggest fan. My grandma was and, and would always say, like, that's going to be you out there someday. That's going to be you. And, you know, kept saying, you okay, you know, maybe. I don't, I, you, at the time, you don't even think it's possible. Um, and when she got sick, unfortunately, was diagnosed with colon cancer. Um, it went downhill quick, um, and we never got the chance to go back to Sonoma. Um, but when it was coming up just a couple months away, she ended up passing in May, and, and um, that was just a month before Sonoma. Um, I was working in my shop, getting a car ready for for a baby grand race, and and she basically told me she she we had a ring camera in there, and I she popped up and said, Hey, Bubba, what are you doing? Popped out from the race car. I was like, Hello. Is grandma and I was like I realized who it was and I was what are you doing grandma she's like I got snuck it on your dad's phone she was listening to me work on the race car and and she was like what are you doing I said I'm getting the car ready for this weekend she said well save me a seat and I, and I just remember this conversation clear as day and I said grandma you can't you know you can't go to the track this weekend I mean at this point she was on hospice maybe a week left I mean it was it was bad and um, she was just clear as day just she told me she's like no I don't mean this weekend silly she said when i'm gone find a way to save me a seat in the car because i want to be there every lap of the you know every step of the way for every lap and i just want to see the day you make it and take me for a lap around sonoma because i've always wanted to do that and i mean my heart sunk i just you don't even know what to say in those moments i just you know okay grandma you know i love you and uh we went on to that race weekend we ended up winning, um, I think the trophy dash, got a trophy, and and uh, first thing we did that night was just run straight home from the track to her place, and I walked up to her room, gave her that trophy, and I mean, that right there, I was talking to my grandma um, that for a while she was going in and out of, you know, kind of saying things that didn't make sense, and, and that was the last conversation I could see in her eyes. My grandma was there. I gave her that trophy. She said, I love you. I was in the room by myself, just with her. She said, I love you. You're doing an amazing job. I gave her a kiss and I walked out. And my sister, she was kind of doing the caretaking. She walked in behind me. And I was only a few steps down the hallway before I heard her call my name. And she said, Bella. And I said, what's that? And she said, was grandma, was grandma awake when you were in here? I said, she's not. And she's like, no, she's asleep. And she never woke back up. Uh, she that was the last time she ever said anything to anyone and the next day she was gone um, so you know for us to come back carrying you know a piece of her with us every step of the way since then she's been there for every lap it I mean running this race at Sonoma is is the only real chance I have to give her what you know she asked me for which you know being my grandma and me being young when she passed there wasn't many chances to do that and not only for myself, but my dad and the rest of the family, um, I know that's uh, that means more than anything racing racing can give us. So it, it goes deep. Having my family around, I, I feel like it's a, an odd way of answering this, but I would say perspective is the first thing that comes to mind. Nobody's seen more of this journey than them and when I was young they saw the passion and, and how much I wanted to be involved in it but couldn't for so long and now that we are here they are so good at pacing me and making me take that step back and just kind of take in the bigger picture and, and capture moments just realizing really where we are now and and seeing it through the eyes of that 10 year old me that would have appreciated it so much I think without taking the time to kind of just do that and check yourself and really say, wow, this is incredible to be here, I think you lose a portion of that hunger, like I was saying, that motivation that you would have at that age. And, you know, they do it without even realizing. I mean, Andy, you know, coming to the races with us, there's times where I see him, like you guys walk into the pits and being like, oh my God, this is Sonoma. You see the big sign up there in the pit road and all the cars out. And I'm like kind of thinking to myself like, you know, I kind of forget how cool this is, um, you know, to other people. And, and once you do it enough, it does start to get normal, which sucks to say, but at some point it's got to, or you can't focus on what you need to do. But if you don't stop and take those moments, 
to remind yourself really of where you are, what you've done to get there, how important it is to you and has been to you your whole life, I think you lose a little bit of the like the empowerment that you had that got you there, that whatever it is you call it, that, that drive that made you who you are to be where you are. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing that they've done for me is just they pace me. When, when I get ahead of myself and just get too in my own head or too focused and not living enough life, they pull the leash and, and remind me to just breathe. The second I grab second gear and am on that last drive to the start finish, I can't tell you the amount of relief. Like coming to that final green white checkered, I was so sick just thinking about all the things that could go wrong and ruin this moment that had gone so well up to that time, it felt so good to get something for all those people that made it possible. The reason coming across that line, all I can think is thank you, thank you, thank you, is the whole time coming to the line, I'm thinking don't ruin this for them, don't ruin this for them, because that's all I wanted was to give all the people that made it possible a physical result to go, this is, this is why we work so hard. Um, and yeah, I, I burst, I just, I melted in the seat. And I, and I know like if I'm excited, I can't even imagine what they're thinking up there. Um, and so of course, like I wish I could see them, but all I can do is talk to them. So I'm just hoping they're on the radio. And I'm just saying the first thing that comes to mind, which is just thank you. Um, Cause when I started this, it was because of them and I'm still doing it because of them. Now, don't get me wrong, we have partners, but I still would not be here if it wasn't for them. Um, yeah, they're, they're just the first people that come to mind every time. Um, and don't, like there's my grandmother, my siblings, Dolores, you know, my team, all those guys are right there, right behind them. But the first people that, you know, the first faces I see in my mind when I think of this journey is them. And so it just, it's, it's hard not to thank them.